Just a quick FYI, since the two books are related, I will be referencing things from my last video about the book World of Patavs. So if you don't understand something I say, probably about the sea statue, then just watch my last video and you will understand. In that book, we learn where the life on Earth came from. In this video, we learn something much more personal about our past. So keep watching to learn the greatest secrets of the universe. Or Larry, Larry Niven's known space universe anyway. <laughs> So, Pock is a pack, or, or Pock, something, something like that. Pack protectors are a race of aliens that live on a planet near the core of the galaxy. They have three stages of life. Child, which is self-explanatory. Breeder, a barely sentient or not quite sentient adult stage, depending on your definition of sentience. They're basically your typical animal, instinct-driven and no significant tool use, so think like chimpanzees. And finally, Protector, where they lose the ability to procreate and become sterile, but also gain incredible intelligence. When a breeder reaches a certain age, suddenly a root that grows all over the planet begins to smell irresistible to them. They call this the Tree of Life, or rather Brennan named it the Tree of Life once uh, Pock brought it to the solar system, but we'll get to that later. So anyway, they will gorge themselves on this route to the point that it will almost burst their stomachs open. Then they will go into a deep coma for several weeks. When they awaken, their bodies have changed. You see, there's a virus that grows inside this root, and when the virus enters their body, it changes their DNA. And just like a caterpillar going into its cocoon, they wake up a completely different creature. They are fiercely intelligent, emphasis on the fierce. They are driven by an overwhelming urge to protect their lineage at all costs. The pack homeworld has been in a constant state of war for at least the last three million years because of this. Every protector aligning with every other protector of their own lineage to fight against all the other lineages. And while their intelligence keeps them from destroying themselves back to the Stone Age, their wars do keep much significant progress from ever happening. This is lucky for the rest of the galaxy because Pack are one of, if not the, most dangerous species in the Milky Way. Pock, or I'll just call him Pock from now on. Pock's family died in this never-ending war. A thermonuclear explosion over his family's valley killed off all the breeders of his line. Usually when this happens, a protector's will to live ends. They stop eating and slowly starve to death. This is the usual way for a protector to die. Very few have ever lived to the end of their natural life cycle. And this is for two reasons. Besides the constant wars killing off their breeders, a pack's lifespan well exceeds 2,000 years. And I mean well exceeds. I, they don't say exactly in the book, but it, it sounds more like 10,000 plus. But um, as I said, it doesn't say exactly in the book. This is how Pock would have died had he not chosen to go to the library. The library is a massive collection of all pack knowledge that they are willing to share at least. For the most part, only childless protectors come here, usually to die. Any military knowledge was usually kept secret by the families and not shared, so it wouldn't be in the library. And anything else could be reinvented easily with how intelligent each individual pack was. But there were, however, records of the past. And while reading these records, Pock came across some information. Pack don't actually want to die. When their families die, it's a psychological reaction to not having their family nearby, or, or maybe a physiological reaction to not having their family smell, because scent is very important to the pack species. And if they don't smell the familiar scent of their family, their bodies start to shut down. This can be overridden if the pack intellectually knows what they're doing is for the good of their families. But even then, they need to go back to their families now and then to let their bodies know they still live. This caveat can be exploited by the ingenious pack, however, and every now and then, a pack is able to live on, as long as they have a goal that they know will help the entirety of the pack as a species. Three million years ago, one pack had such a goal. A goal that seemed so worthy to other pack that many other childless pack joined in the project and lived on. They wanted to expand the pack species beyond the pack homeworld. Clear to any logical species, two nests are better than one. If one planet is destroyed, the other can live on. It doubles the chances that the species will survive. 
So this group of childless protectors took an asteroid and melted it and formed it into a habitat. They then attached engines to this habitat, and as a final step before leaving their star system, they killed all the protectors of one family and placed all the breeders on the Ark with them. Slowly but surely, this Ark made its way out into the arms of the Milky Way, where they found a habitable planet. They landed on this planet, and after wiping out any dangerous native fauna, they let their breeders roam free, and the breeders then lived up to their names. The protectors planted the tree of life root on their new planet and all seemed well. For the first time in history, a group of unrelated pack worked together without fighting. With the one caveat to that being the library, of course. There was plenty to do to ensure the survival of the breeders they had brought, and they expected their time to be limited. You see, once the breeders began to eat the tree of life themselves, they would become new protectors who would then be related to the breeders. They would not trust the non-related protectors, and the never-ending pack wars would assuredly come to this new planet as the new protectors killed the old ones that had brought them there. But this never happened. Something was wrong with the tree of life. It seemed to grow normally, but when the breeders ate it, nothing happened. Breeders were growing up past the normal age of transition. They were becoming so old that the tree of life would kill them if they ate it. This was a disaster. So for the first time in pack history, two more things happened. Breeders began to die of pseudo-old age from not being able to make the transition, and the pack protectors themselves began to die of actual old age. All the protectors worked together until the day they died trying to figure out a solution to the problem at hand, but they never did. This colony of breeders kept breeding on their own, never to mature into a protector and with no protectors to watch over them, but they had the most important stage of life, breeder, so they kept making more of themselves. When Pock read of this colony in the library, he knew what he must do. He would be like those packs so long ago, and he would organize the childless protectors into a rescue force. They would revive that ancient dream of spreading the pack among the stars. In the intervening years, the solution had been found. The tree of life root required high levels of thallium in the soil to be able to support its viral load. Something the pack homeworld, being near the core of the galaxy, had, but something this much further out planet did not. So with help from the other childless protectors, Puck designed a ship that would take him to this planet, and he would carry with him seeds, roots, and plenty of thallium to grow all the tree of life they could ever need, keeping in mind that once the other protectors had been made, they could refine more for themselves. So for over 1,400 years, Puck flew alone on his rescue mission. Actually, he flew for over 30,000 years, but thanks to time dilation, he only experienced 1,400. As he neared the end of that mission, a blue marble grew in his telescopes, and the residents of the asteroid belt of Sol System noticed a strange new light headed in their direction. Only 14 years earlier, the sea statue had gotten loose and tried to take over the Earth, so the governments of humanity were not too trusting of a new alien. Once again, Lucas Garner was put on the case. In World of Patavs, he did a lot of chasing and had a lot of good ideas, but in the end, it was Greenberg who stopped the threat. In Protector, it's not much different for poor Lucas, who is now 184 years old, by the way. Same for Lit Schaefer, Beowulf Schaefer's dad, I might add, who is in both books, but has no real effect on the plot. Beowulf Schaefer, if you didn't know, is the main character of many short stories written by Larry Niven and is the main character of a collection of short stories called Crashlander. I also did a video on that if you're interested. So as humanity watches this strange ship enter the Sol system, the pack on board sees a ship going in the same general direction as he is traveling and matches course. There is only one man on this ship, and his name is Jack Brennan. Brennan thinks about changing course and trying to get away, but who would turn down the chance to be the first man to ever meet an alien? The sea statue story was mostly kept under wraps, and those that did hear about it passed it off as a fairy tale. 
but even those that believed the stories or happened to know that they were true thought that the threat inside the sea statue was more of an earthling than any human, since it had been on the earth for more than a billion years. So many did not even consider it an alien, just a relic from the past. But this was a spaceship that came from unknown space with an unknown engine. It was driven by a bussard ramjet, a drive that creates a magnetic field that funnels interstellar hydrogen into the engine where it fuses into helium and gives thrust. This is an engine design that can theoretically go on forever since it gets its gas as it travels. Or fuel, I should say, not gas. Although, actually, hydrogen and helium are gases, so I guess that's appropriate. <laughs> Humans had also made this drive, but only for unmanned ships. The same magnetic field that fed the ship would kill any humans inside of it. But this ship seemed to have been made with a pocket inside the magnetic field that was not deadly, where the pilot stayed. It pulled up alongside Jack Brennan's ship and matched speed. After a while, Jack saw a roughly humanoid shape step out onto the hull of the alien vessel. Jack stepped out to do the same after a bit of hesitation. When the creature saw Jack, it leapt the several hundred yards from its own ship to Jack's without the need of a jetpack. It landed on Jack's ship, grabbed Jack's arm, and leapt back to its own ship where it deposited a struggling Jack inside. Its strength was amazing, and Jack was like a thrashing child in their parents' grip. Pock then separated the three sections of his ship. He sent off the drive section in hopes that it would distract anyone following and took his cargo section to Mars where he landed in deep dust so that the ship could be hidden. During this entire time, Pock had been studying his captive. He was confused. This creature it had obtained was very much like a breeder, but not at the same time. Its face was much flatter and its jaw protruded far less. He assumed it was just a coincidence until it bloodied its hands trying to get into the store of Tree of Life Root. He began to look around him. The light was greener than the sunlight tubes he was used to. The only clear space was the space he floated in, as roomy as the life system of his single ship. On his right were a number of squarish crates whose material was almost wood, certainly a plant of some kind. To his left, a massive rectangular solid with a lid, almost like a big deep freeze. Above and around him, the curved wall. So he'd been right, this was a cargo hold. But half of the space in this teardrop-shaped hold was still locked off from him. And all through the air, a peculiar scent, like an unfamiliar perfume. The smell in the life system had been an animal smell, the smell of an outsider. This was different. Below him, behind a net of coarse weave, were things that looked like yellow roots. They occupied most of what Brennan could see of the cargo hold. Brennan jumped down at them, wrapped his fingers in the net to bring his eyes closer. The smell became hugely more intense. He'd never smelled, imagined, dreamed anything like it. They still looked like yellow pale roots, a cross between a sweet potato and a peeled piece of the root of a small tree. They were squat and flat and fibrous, pointed at one end and knife flattened at the other. Brennan reached through the net, got a two-finger grip of one, tried to pull it through the net and couldn't. He'd had breakfast just before the outsider pulled alongside, yet with no warning, grumblings in his belly, suddenly he was ravenously hungry. His lips skinned back from teeth and gums. He stabbed his fingers through the net, grasped for the roots. For minutes, he tried to pull one through holes that were just too small. He tore at the net, raging. The net was stronger than human flesh. It would not tear, though fingernails did. He screamed his frustration. The scream brought him to his senses. Suppose he did get one out. Then what? Eat it. His mouth ran saliva. It would kill him. An alien plant from an alien world? A plant that an alien species probably saw as food? He should be thinking of a way out of here. Yet his fingers were still tearing at the net. Brennan kicked himself away. He was hungry. The fragments of his suit were gone, left behind in the outsider's cabin, including the water and food syrup nipples in his helmet. Was there water in here? Could he trust it? Would the outsider guess that he had a use for partially burnt hydrogen? What would he do for food? He had to get out of here. 
the plastic bag. He fielded it from the air and examined it. He found out how to seal and unseal it from the outside. Wonderful. Wait, yes, he could turn the bag inside out, seal it from the inside. Then what? He couldn't move around in the plastic bag. No hands. Even in his own suit, it would have been risky jumping across eight miles of space without a backpack. He couldn't get through the wall anyway. So he had to distract his stomach somehow. So, why were the contents of this hold so valuable? How could they be worth more than the pilot who was needed to get them where they were going? Might as well see what else is here. The rectangular solid was a glossy, temperatureless material. Brennan found the handle easily enough, but he couldn't budge it. Then the smell of the roots made a concerted attack on his hunger, and he yelled and pulled with all his strength of killing rage. The handle jarred open. It was built for outsider strength. The box was filled with seeds, large seeds like almonds, frozen in a matrix of frost, bitterly cold. He wrenched one loose with numbing fingers. The air about him was turning the color of cigarette smoke when he closed the lid. He put the seed in his mouth, warmed it with saliva. It had no taste. It was merely cold. And then, not even that, he spat it out. So, green light and strange, rich-smelling air, but not too thin, not too strange, and the light was cool and refreshing. If Brennan liked the Outsider's life system, the Outsider would like Earth. He had brought a crop to plant, too. Seeds, roots, and what? Brennan kicked across the clear space to the stack of crates. Not all the strength of his back and legs would tear a crate loose from the wall. Contact cement? But a lid came up with great reluctance and a creaking noise. Sure enough, it had been glued down. The wood itself had torn away. Brennan wondered what strange plant had produced it. Inside was a sealed plastic bag. Plastic? It looked and felt as strong as commercial sandwich wrap, gone crinkly with age. What was inside felt like fine dust packed nearly solid. It was dark through the plastic. Brennan floated near the crates, one hand gripping the torn lid. He wondered. An autopilot, of course. The outsider was only a backup for the autopilot. It didn't matter what happened to him. He was only a safety device. The autopilot would get this crop to where it was going. To Earth? But a crop meant other outsiders, following. He had to warn Earth. Right, good thinking. How? Brennan laughed at himself. Was ever a man so completely trapped? The outsider had him. Brennan, a belter and a free man, had allowed himself to become property. His laughter died into despair. Despair was a mistake. The smell of the roots had been waiting to pounce. It was the pain that brought him out of it. His hands were bleeding from cuts and abrasions. There were sprains and blisters and bruises. His left little finger screamed its agony at him. It stuck out at a strange angle and swelled as he watched. Dislocated or broken. But he torn a hole in the net, and his right hand gripped a fibrous root. He threw it as hard as he could and instantly curled in upon himself, hugging his knees as if to surround his pain and smother it. He was angry. He was scared. Why, that damnable smell had turned off his mind as if he were no more than a child's toy robot. He floated through the cargo space like a football, hugging his knees and crying. He was hungry and angry and humiliated and scared. The outsider had seared his mind with his own unimportance. But this was worse. Why? What did the outsider want with him? Something smacked him across the back of the head. In one fluid motion, Brennan snatched the missile out of the air and bit into it. The root had returned to him on a ricochet orbit. It was tough and fibrous between his teeth. Its taste was as indescribable and as delicious as its scent. In a last lucid moment, Brennan wondered how long he would take to die. He didn't much care. He bit again and swallowed. So these humans were packed descendants after all, left alone for over two million years. They looked a little different, but they seemed to be reacting correctly to the tree of life. This breeder gorged himself on the root, then went into the coma. And he appears to be progressing into a protector at the right rate. Suddenly, Pock realized that he had completed his mission. He had succeeded. He had brought tree of life to the lost colony. Now, he had no more goals. His appetite disappeared.
All that was left was to show this new protector how the tree of life works, and then he would kill him as the threat to his own breeders that he was. And this is exactly what happened. When Pox showed the Brennan protector the tree of life and told him what it does and how it works, Brennan immediately killed Pock, but not for the reasons Pock assumed. Brennan knew humanity, you see. He knew that not only was the Tree of Life dangerous, it could turn the Earth into a constantly warring wasteland just like the Pock homeworld. But humans wouldn't want it. You have to eat it by the time you are 60, at the latest, or it will kill you instead of transform you. But with the advances in medicine, it was not uncommon to live past 150. The oldest living people were living past 200. 45 is the prime of your life. There's still so much left. Nobody would be willing to turn themselves into a monster just for a few extra years, especially when you had to make the decision when you were still sexually active, and this transformation will not just make you sterile, you won't have any sexual organs at all left afterwards. If Pock had discovered this, he would have considered the human race to be too mutated, and therefore a threat to his people instead of a backup to them. So Brennan killed Pock, because if he had known what Brennan knew, he would wipe out humanity. After killing Pock, Brennan tried to make it to the only human base on Mars, which is where he ran into Lucas Garner. This is a scene very reminiscent to when Lucas Garner saved Larry Greenberg from Pluto in World of Patavs. Only this time, the story was not over. Protector Brennan got loose once they took him off Mars and he escaped into the outer solar system, where for a few hundred years, he took samples of humanity. He would abduct one person every 10 years to study, then return them after four months. After over 200 years of this, he abducted Roy Truesdale. Roy was not happy to find out that four months of his life had disappeared, and he went on a search to find out who had taken them from him. His search eventually led him out past Pluto to Persephone, the 10th planet. Ninth, I guess, if you don't consider Pluto a planet, but they do in this book because it was written in 1973. <laughs> ah, the joys of a book written in the past about the future. <laughs> These kind of things make me laugh. A 10th planet we discovered in the 1980s, when in reality, we lost Pluto as a planet in 2006. So instead of the 10 he predicted, we actually only have eight. <laughs> Larry Niven had no clue what the future would hold, but he made some pretty good guesses. But this obviously wasn't one of them. Although some people still think there might be a planet out past Neptune. One thing that repeatedly struck me as funny during this book and World of Patavs was that Larry never guessed how data storage would work or display screens for that matter. Even though they have teleconferencing in this book, at one point, Larry comes out of the shower to find an entire novel's worth of info had been printed out on his stand, almost like a fax machine. At several other points, they just set their transmitting messages to repeat, instead of just transmitting a video to the receiver so that they could watch it whenever they wanted to, as we do now. He clearly never thought of storing the data that was transmitted on the receiving end. <laughs> So anyway, as Truesdale approaches Persephone, the 10th planet, something takes over his ship. It was Brennan with a gravity drive he had developed. He was forcing the ship to his hideout, a previous moon of Persephone. His hideout is one of the most amazing structures in all of sci-fi, in my opinion. It's a small donut-shaped structure, and in its hole was what looks like King Kai's planet from Dragon Ball. A small planet that you could walk all the way around in an hour or so with one large tree on it. Covering all the land on both the sphere and donut were plants and animals. It was completely landscaped. The donut's surface was kept gravitized by Brennan's gravity generator so that it could be walked on at all points. But inside the sphere, however, was a core of neutronium. And to prevent that neutronium from decaying into the hard radiation that would kill anything and everything on the sphere, it was encased in a slaver stasis field, just like the sea statue, a.k.a. Kazanel the Thrint. Apparently, slaver stasis fields are just that. Whatever is inside them still has its normal mass. Here's a little food for thought, though. How can you move a stasis field around when time is basically stopped inside? Because in World of Patavs, that's explained how it works, is it basically slows down time to the point where it's almost completely stopped inside. 
So wouldn't moving something with a mass inside an ultra-slowed environment require almost infinite energy? Because to it, you are moving it faster than light speed. Well, I guess the Tanuktapun that invented it are just smarter than I am. <laughs> So there's a stream or waterfall that attaches the donut to the sphere. And since Brennan told Roy he can swim in any water he finds, he swam up the waterfall slash stream to the sphere and then back again. The stream went one way in one side and the other way on the other side. He found he could pick which way he wanted to go just by sticking his head out of the correct side of the waterfall stream, whatever you want to call it. So while Roy is there at the hideout, Brennan discovers that there's a fleet of pack protectors headed directly for them. They had followed Pock. Something must have happened in the galactic core to drive them all off their planet. We find out in later books that the core of the galaxy is exploding. The densely packed stars at the center of the galaxy are all going off in a chain of supernovae. When one star blows, it causes the nearby ones to also blow, and this chain reaction had hit critical mass and the entire center of the galaxy was going supernova. But for now, all we know is that something must have driven them away from their homeworld, and they decided that their best hope for survival was to follow Pock and hope he had found, if not the lost colony, at least a habitable world. Brendan finds out the pack are coming in waves, and the first scouts are already almost to the solar system. It turns out that the donut is actually Brennan's ship, and he uses the sphere of neutronium to accelerate his ship to massive speeds using its gravity. His donut-shaped ship shoots past the sphere like it was a cannonball being shot through the loop. Only the loop was moving instead of the cannonball. In one of the most ruthless scenes in any of the known space books, Brennan first destroys three of the four lead scouts and then heads to a planet called Home. It's an Earth colony, a very Earth-like world with around three million residents. This was before humanity had any FTL, might I remind you, so travel between colonies and Earth took decades usually. Even with Brennan's massive acceleration he got from his donut eating a golf ball maneuver, it still took several years to get to home. During that time, Roy began to get wise to Brennan's plan. How would Brennan get the small population of home to develop into a war machine capable of taking out multiple fleets of pack protectors? Why didn't Brennan just go to Earth? The only solution he could think of was that Brennan was going to release the Tree of Life root on home, where every human between 40 and 60 would eat it and become a protector, and every human older than that would eat it and die. He confronted Brennan with his idea and Brennan denied it. But Roy still didn't trust him. He tried to escape and ended up killing Brennan in the process. Brennan could easily have killed him first, but Roy, turns out, was one of Brennan's genetic line. He instinctually could not hurt one of his own breeders, and that gave Roy the time he needed to kill Brennan instead. Roy, injured by the fight, went down to home and tried to warn them, but he passed out from the damage he took. When he woke up, everything was different. Every human protector must wake this way. A pack wakes sentient for the first time. A human protector has human memories. He wakes clear-headed and remembers and thinks with a certain amount of embarrassment, I've been stupid. White ceiling, clean, coarse sheets over soft mattress, mobile pastel screens on both sides of me, windows before me, a view of small, twisted trees on a somewhat patchy lawn all bathed in sunlight that was a bit orange for Earth. Primitive facilities and lots of room. I was in a home hospital, and I'd been stupid. If Brennan had only... But he shouldn't have had to tell me anything. That close to home, of course he'd infected himself. In a pinch, he need only see to it that he or his corpse reached home. And he'd let me catch it, same reasoning. He'd told me most of it. What he'd really been after out there beyond the edges of the solar system, with his Tree of Life supply left behind on Mars, was a variant of the Tree of Life virus that would grow in an apple or a pomegranate or something. What he'd gotten was a variant that would live in a yam grown with thallium oxide, but somewhere in there, he'd found or created a variety that would grow in a human being. 
That was what he'd been planning to seed on home. A mean trick to play on a defenseless colony. Such a virus would probably not restrict itself to the right age limit. It would kill anyone who wasn't between, assuming broad limits, 40 and 60. Holm would have ended as a world of childless protectors, and Brennan would have had his army. I got up and startled a nurse. She was on the other side of a flexible plastic wall. We were sealed in with our infection. There were two rows of beds, and on each, a half-changed protector showing signs of starvation. Probably all the proto-protectors on home are right here in this big room. Twenty-six of us. Now what? I thought it through while the nurse was getting a doctor, and the doctor was donning a pressure suit. Plenty of time. My thoughts moved so fast. Most problems were not problems long enough to be interesting. I checked Brennan's chain of logic, then started over. For the moment, I must believe what Brennan had said about the pack themselves. There were no inconsistencies in his picture. He'd lied brilliantly, if he'd lied at all, and I couldn't see a motive. I'd observed the pack ships directly, via Brennan's instruments. Well, I could check those by designing the induced gravity generator independently. A blonde young woman came in through a makeshift airlock. I frightened her by being both ugly and mobile. She politely tried to conceal it. We need food, I told her. All of us. I'd be dead now if I hadn't been carrying a lot of superfluous muscle weight when I caught the infection. She nodded and spoke to the nurse via a pen-sized mic. She gave me a physical. I told her just enough to upset her badly. I should have been dead or crippled by arthritis by most of the rules of medicine. I did some calisthenics for her to prove that I was healthy. I held back so that she wouldn't know how healthy. It's not a crippling disease, I told her. We'll be able to lead normal lives once the infection has run its course. It only affects our appearance. Or had you noticed? She blushed. I watched her debate with herself as to whether to tell me that I'd lost all hope of normal sexual relations. She decided I couldn't handle it yet. You will have to make some adjustments, she said delicately. I suppose so. This disease, is it from Earth? No, from the belt, fortunately, made it a lot easier to control. In fact, we thought it was extinct. If I thought there was even the slightest chance, well, I hope you can tell us something about treatment. We haven't been able to cure any of you, she said. Everything we tried made things worse, even antibiotics. We lost three of you. The others didn't seem to be getting any worse, so we just left you alone. A good thing you stopped before you got to me. She thought that was callous, had she but known. I was the only man on home who had so much as heard the word pack. I spent the next few days force-feeding the other patients. They would not eat of themselves. There was no taste of tree of life root and normal food. They were all near death. Brennan had known what he was doing when he let me put on all that extra muscle weight. Between times, I learned what I could about the industries of home. I used the hospital library tapes. I set up possible defenses against a pack attack. Using a probable of two million breeders, we'd have to set up a dictatorship. There just wasn't time for anything else. We'd lose some of the population that way, and exactly 26 protectors. I set up alternate lines of defense using 24 and 22 protectors in case we didn't all make it through transition. But these were just thought problems. 26 wasn't enough. Not nearly enough. Not from what I could learn of Holmes' level of civilization. When the other patients woke, I could put it to them. They knew more of home. They might get answers different from mine. I waited. There was time. The pack scouts were nine months away. I worked out ways to destroy home using a pack scout pair. I redesigned Protector using what we'd learned of pack scouts since Brennan built Protector. That's the name of the donut, by the way. Protector. In six days, they started waking up. Twenty-four of us. Dr. Martin and Cowles had caught the infection from their patients. They were still changing. It was a joyful thing, talking to men whose minds matched my own. Poor Brennan. I talked fast, knowing that that and my Flatlander accent would make me incomprehensible to any breeder who might be listening. As I talked, they moved about the room, testing their muscles and their new bodies. Yet I could know that they were missing not a word. When I had finished, we spent several hours discussing the situation. We had to learn if Brennan could have faked the sightings of the pack fleet and pack scouts. We were lucky. Len Bester was a fusion drive repairman. He was able to design an induced gravity generator. He said it would work and gave us enough theory to convince us. 
and told us how it could be made to behave. We decided to accept Brennan's gravity telescope and the pack fleet. Otherwise, there were ways he could have faked what I had seen of the pack scouts. We would get no more verification of Brennan's story, aside from its internal consistency, which we also verified. We made our plans accordingly. We smashed our way through the plastic airlock and swarmed through the hospital. It was all over before the hospital personnel knew what had happened. We confined them until the Tree of Life virus should render them dormant. Many wanted to continue to care for their patients. This we let them do, but we had to destroy all of the medical supplies. There was danger that when the people started collapsing with Tree of Life virus, others would screw up their physiology trying to treat them. The Claytown police presently surrounded the hospital, but by then we could assume that everyone in the hospital was infected. In the night, we scattered. In the days that followed, we attacked hospitals, drugstores, the single pharmaceutical plant. We destroyed television stations to slow the spread of news. People would panic if they learned of a new disease that took the minds of its victims and started spreading itself intelligently. They would find the truth no less horrifying. We found panic enough. Holmes' populace fought us as they would have fought devils out of hell. Ten of us died that way, trapped and bound not to kill potential protectors and six of us were caught trying to save their families, equipping them with pressure suits or pressure tents to keep out the virus, and hiding them where they could. It wasn't necessary to kill them. We confined them until the breeders in question were dead or in transition. In a week, it was over. In three weeks, they started to wake up. We began building our defenses. All right, so that's the full story of Protector by Larry Niven. Uh, I think I'm going to continue down this line and I might do uh, maybe Flatlander next, something like that. I think I'm going to do uh, a few more Larry Niven novels before I move on back to something else. So I uh, hope you enjoy them and hope to see you back here again for the next one. Thanks for watching. Man, Larry Niven sure does love his weird letter combinations, doesn't he?